Hey, what's up, folks? How you doing? It's your friend Phil here, Project Management Trainer and Coach. It gives me great pleasure to be presenting to you the Pembroke Guide 6 edition. You know, I've been trying to dodge doing this because I kept saying, oh, they're going to get certified on the 5th. But I've decided to accept my fate. I know I am going to have students who are trying to get certified on the 5th who are going to be studying the 6th. In fact, I was taking a look at an email not too long ago from a student that said, hey, Phil, when are you going to come out with your 6th edition stuff so I can get the ball rolling? I already know my fate. I'm not going to be able to do this 5th edition thing. So while that's unfortunate, it is good to have you as a student studying the 6th edition. So this is from my series that is titled PMBOK Guide 6th Edition Short and Sweet for the PMP exam. This is going to be a short and sweet digest of the chapters in the PMBOK Guide. Now, full disclosure, the first three chapters, I'm going to give those to you right here on YouTube you are going to get a very succinct dive into the Pembroke Guide 6th edition for the first three chapters. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is when I started studying for my PMP exam, I did so in error. I was actually studying a wrong version of the Pembroke Guide. They were going through that transitionary period, trying to change the exam from the second to the third, so both the second and the third were being studied by two groups of people, kind of like what's happening now. And as I picked up the third edition to study, going to the Mesa Library in Arizona to hit the books hard every Saturday. It was like I was hidden a brick wall. I was hidden this big brick wall, and I couldn't get through the Pembroke Guide. I just could not understand what exactly are they talking about. I've written a dissertation on project management. How come I don't really get what they're trying to say? So it was very frustrating for me, and that's why I decided to come out with my short and sweet series to help students who are trying to tackle this ridiculously huge 756-page book. This is to help you so that when you crack open the first few pages, chapter by chapter, it's going to make sense. You're going to say, oh, yeah, this is what Phil said they meant. So as you hit the book, you're going to say, oh, no big deal. Yeah, I understand what the summary is. And hopefully, as you dive into it, as you begin to shovel this boatload of content off your plate, hopefully it's going to make a lot more sense than it would have if you didn't have it. All right. So let's go. Let's talk about the Pembok Guide. I'm going to give you the short and sweet version, just remember that. We're going to talk about the overview and the purpose of this thing called the Pembok Guide. So the Pembok Guide has been around for a while, you know, but not for hundreds of years, right? Now, it is interesting to know that the Pembok Guide documents processes, procedures, and guidelines that in some way, shape, or form have been around for a long time. You know, think about it, project management. It's been around. What is project management? Managing projects. Projects are short-term endeavors that are undertaken to deliver a result. So diving into some of these rather interesting examples the PMI gave in the PMBOK guide regarding this overview, they talk about the pyramids of Giza way back. 2560 BC. They talk about the Great Wall of China around 206 or so BC, the Taj Mahal, and they give all sorts of examples, landing on the moon and so on. But you don't need to look too far to really understand what exactly project management is. If you've ever done home improvement projects, hey, those are projects. Those are projects. So when you hear the term project management and projects, know that projects are short-term endeavors undertaken to deliver a result, such as the ones I just mentioned. And when we talk about project management, it's the management of those projects, okay? But we'll talk more about that later. Let's talk about the standard for project management. The standard for project management is included as part two in this 
book called The Pembok Guide. But if you talk about what a standard is, a standard is generally accepted good practices, right? The standard for project management is documented exclusively in part two because it gives you those processes that have been found to be good practices on most projects most of the time. Now, the PMI, they're very careful not to m mention this as best practices. So they're good practices. Whether they're best practices is, of course, debatable. So still talking about why we have this book called the PMBOK Guide, we have the common lexicon of project management presented in the PMBOK Guide. It gives you that foundation. It gives you a common language so that wherever you go in the world, whether you go to China, you go to Saudi Arabia, you go to the UK, you are affiliated with the PMI, you have studied the PMBOK Guide, you know these terms, hey, you can speak the same language if you call a document a project management plan. The project managers in those countries know exactly what you're talking about. The Code of Ethics is talked about as well. In the Code of Ethics, I will call your attention to a document that you can search for. Google it, the PMI Code of Ethics. It really gives you an idea of what is good ethics for anyone affiliated with the PMI, be you a PMP, a PGMP, a project manager who is just a member of the PMI. It's definitely a code worth reading if you're taking the PMP exam. If you're affiliated with the PMI in any way, if you're getting ready to take the exams, this code of ethics is not optional. Now, it does sound a little bit straightforward, basic. Why is this even a document? But you'll be surprised at how many people do not have a good idea of PMI's perspective of ethics. Things like fairness and honesty may be practiced differently in different parts of the country, in different parts of the world. So for that reason, the code of ethics is there to put everyone on the same page. It gives you that foundation to understand what PMI considers to be good ethics. All right, well, let's move on here. Let's go on to our next section in the PMBOK Guide. We call this foundational elements of the PMBOK Guide. So these are the basics. In this area, we talk about what is a project. What are projects? Well, like I said, projects are short-term endeavors that we undertake to deliver a product, service, or result. Projects give you a unique product, service, or result. Now, when we say unique, we mean it's unique by virtue of the customer, the time of the year, even if it's similar to a previous project, okay? So projects, again, short-term endeavors, they are unique. Projects are also temporary. They don't continue forever and ever. They are also progressively elaborated, which means we learn more about the project as we proceed, okay? We don't know every single thing about the project at once. Projects are also really important in firms because they drive change. They take organizations from their current state, where they are, to a future state. They take projects from a current state of lower business value to a future state of higher business value. And that value, it could be in the form of monetary assets, stockholder equity, utility fixtures, that the future state of the firm really depends on what the strategic business objectives of the organization are. You know, perhaps they want to grow their market share. Perhaps they want better facilities. It really depends, you know. More intangible elements could be in the form of goodwill, maybe recognition of their brand, of the company brand, strategic alignment, and their reputation. Social media is big these days. That could be a project. You know, so taking an organization from one state of low reputation to higher reputation on social media and so on. When we talk about projects, though, it's important that we realize certain factors influence these projects, not just what the strategic business objectives are. Those could actually be underpinned by other things, such as 
the need to meet a certain regulatory requirement or the need to satisfy stakeholders, uh, give stakeholders better satisfaction to create new products or services to be competitive in the marketplace or to implement change, maybe some business process reengineering. Those are all reasons why projects come into existence. Going over to the next section, when we talk about project management, what exactly is project management? This is talked about in 1.2.1, and project management is the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to meet the project requirements, to deliver the deliverable. Students of mine, they don't dwell on the PMBOK guide definition when I call upon them because it's long, it's hard to memorize at first. So some students just say, fail. Project management is all about getting stuff done. And that's true, getting stuff done. But to take it a step further, it's getting stuff done in a timely and orderly fashion to meet the needs of the customer, to meet the needs of the client, to meet those requirements. That is really what project management is. Project management is very important for many reasons because projects help a whole lot. They help the customer. They help the company meet the business objectives that they're seeking to. It also enables stakeholders be satisfied. It enables the project team to respond to risks in an orderly fashion, in a timely fashion, instead of running around and doing firefighting all the time, project management helps you get your stuff aligned. It helps you know what's coming down the pike and it helps you be organized. It helps you minimize waste, sometimes even prevent waste. You know, when projects aren't properly managed, we see what happens, missed deadlines, poor quality, rework, cost overruns, stakeholders are upset, and the inability to deliver the benefits that you set out to deliver in the first place. You know, so project management is very, very important. That cannot be overstated, the importance of project management. In the next section, we're going to talk about the relationships of these three things, projects, programs, portfolios, and operations management. These three things, or I should say four things, adding in operations, are very important as you study the PMBOK guide. So think about the singular endeavor called a project, right? A project is a temporary endeavor. It's a one-time thing that we're undertaking to deliver a product, a service, or result. But let's take it a step further. Let's talk about what program management is. Now, the word program is used loosely in a lot of firms, but really a program refers to a collection of interrelated projects, interrelated projects that are managed in a coordinated way, that are managed in a structured and orderly way. When you think about a program, think about multiple interrelated projects that are managed in a coordinated way to obtain benefits and control that would not be available by managing the projects individually. If we talk about project A on its own, it won't deliver the benefits that it would if we put it with project B and C. For example, think about a hardware project and a software project. What do I mean by hardware? Well, think about hardware like your computer, like a server, and think about a, a software project to deliver new software. Well, if that software hinges on certain hardware to make it run effectively on a system, you're going to have hardware, software, and the integration. So think about projects A, B, and C. These projects on their own are okay, but you don't get the benefits you don't get the control, especially if you've got shared resources and so on. You see? So when we talk about programs, think about these interrelated projects. Now, to go a step further, the PMI also talk about subsidiary programs or sub-programs. 
in some firms, a sub-program is not as big or as prominent as a program, but it's not as small as a project either. And it has projects in it as well, perhaps smaller than ordinary or usual projects. Or perhaps they're classified in some other way. So when you think about programs, think about multiple projects, think about sub-programs that are managed together in a coordinated way. All right, so that's the first idea I'd like to share with you if you're not really used to these terms, programs, and another term is portfolio management. So when you think about program management, of course, it's managing programs. When you think about portfolio management, it's the management of portfolios. And a portfolio is a collection of projects and programs and operational work and something called sub-portfolios. Now, to give you a good landscape of what a portfolio is, think about an organization. An organization that does water engineering projects and road projects. Think about the organization being so diverse that it also does IT projects. And it's also into healthcare. What sort of company is this? They're everywhere. They've got a massive portfolio. You see the use of the word portfolio. They've got water projects, road projects, IT projects, healthcare projects. That's their portfolio. Now, the sub-portfolio could be their water projects or their IT projects or their healthcare projects. You, you get the idea? So a portfolio is that collection of projects and programs. Now, to give you a better idea, think about the portfolio containing programs from the water sector, programs from the IT sector, and at the same time having solo projects. You see? So it's a collection of projects and programs from whatever areas. Subsidiary portfolios, like I said, could be these areas. So everything rolls up. And if you wanted to get an idea of this, you would need to go to figure 1-3 in the PMBOK guide to see an idea of a portfolio. Okay? So you've got the big overarching sample portfolio, but inside it, you've got portfolio A, and you could have portfolio B and portfolio C. And then you've got standalone programs, and then you could also have standalone projects. All right, so use your imagination. If you've got any questions, I want you to shoot me questions down below this video. All right, shoot me some questions and let me explain further if you've got any questions about this. All right, now let's go over to operations and project management. So we know what project management is. We've talked about it. But what is an operation? An operation is a repetitive endeavor that is undertaken to support the business. It's the daily grind. It's what we do all the time. Okay, so... We do these projects, programs, and portfolios across a span of time. Portfolios go on forever, hopefully if the company exists. Programs may continue for a very long time. But projects have a start and a definite end. A program could be a multi-year program. A program could go on for 10 or even more years. Because as the program evolves, the scope could change. And the scope could continue changing. Some firms may categorize their programs for a particular year, XYZ program 2016 or 2017. But if you really look at it, projects are the shortest pieces in all of this. All right? So when we talk about operations and project management, see... Projects intersect with operations. As the operations are ongoing to support the business, it's possible that projects would be needed to expand the output, for example, or to improve the operation, or to do some enhancement of sorts. So that's where projects and operations intersect. And that's talked about in the PMBOK guide as well. I've talked about operations management. It's repetitive. It's meant to support the business. It goes on, it goes on, and, and on. 
and operations management, a quick flip of numbers here, think about operations management as being 1.2.3.4 and operations and project management intersected as actually being 1.2.3.5. Just in case you're following along, taking a look at your PMBOK guide. All right, 1.2.3.6 goes into something called OPM, Organizational Project Management and Strategy. So I'm just going to quote from the PMBOK guide. It says, portfolios, programs, and projects are aligned with or driven by organizational strategies and differ in the way each contributes to the achievement of strategic goals. So OPM is the overarching mindset of aligning business strategy to projects, programs, and portfolios. Okay, portfolio management aligns portfolios with the organizational strategies. Program management harmonizes its program components, and project management enables the achievement of organizational goals and objectives. It's really in those economies of scale, portfolios, massive, programs, not as big, projects smaller than those under most circumstances. So once upon a time, there was a certification called the OPM3, Organizational Project Management Maturity Model, which I ended up taking. It's no longer being offered by the PMI, but there is a standard, and you might want to go study the OPM3 standard. It's out there. You might still be able to get it before the new OPM standard comes in, but you can read that as well. So PMI have asked you to refer to Implementing Organizational Project Management, a practice guide. So that will give you some ideas. But when you think about OPM, it starts off by having that strategy for the organization. Having that strategy is not just going to become manifest without first sharing the vision and training people. People need to be trained to embrace the project management vision for the firm and understand where the company is going from a project management standpoint. And then as the portfolio is crafted, people know how to manage their programs and projects because there's a big difference between portfolios versus projects and programs portfolio management is doing the right work when you think about great portfolio management it's all about doing the right work but when you think about programs and projects it's about doing the work right get it doing the right work versus doing the work right okay Let's move on to our next section here, 1.4. And this is all about components of the guide. So what are components of this guide? Let's talk about that really quickly. First of all, you've got project and development life cycles. What is a life cycle? A life cycle is a series of phases. You can have a life cycle for anything that has a process to deliver something. Life cycle for coding and testing, it's called a SDLC, Software Development Life Cycle. It's a project life cycle, right? Feasibility, um, feasibility analysis, design, uh, develop, test, maintain, for example. And it's more elaborate than that in many instances. Or you could even think of the life cycle for constructing a building, right? Or the life cycle for baking a cake, something as mundane as that. You see, I'm trying to get you to see what a life cycle is. It's these series of steps or phases that you need to pass through from a technical point, from a technical perspective. It's not to manage what is being done. A project life cycle is not the management of the work. It's the doing. The life cycle is the doing. You see, it's all about the doing. So if you think about what you need to do to get that work done, to get that deliverable out, that's your project life cycle right there. Okay? So project life cycles are important, important in the world of projects because that's what gets the work done. Okay? A project phase is just one tiny little piece. It's a step, right? It's a step in the grander scheme of things. But if you 
break that step down within each phase you've got a collection of logically related project activities and the end of a phase delivers a deliverable it delivers something tangible and definite be it a product a service a result or sub product or sub widget maybe a sub component of something else that's a project phase now we also use this term phase review and when you think about phase review it's really a phase gate or a phase exit it's a review at the end of each phase so if projects are being well managed you don't just go from phase to the next phase you should have a phase end review to find out did we really meet the mark did we get what we were looking for and can we move on those are some of the questions that should be asked the next thing is project management processes that's in the PMBOK guide and in 12 uh, 1.2.4.4 this is talked about so there are 49 processes in the PMBOK guide 6th edition okay and this is talked about in the PMBOK guide in a lot more detail but at a high level you need to know that these are specific project activities that are geared towards delivering an output and that output sometimes may become an input to another project management process so we've made a shift here I don't know if you saw the shift from project life cycle that's all about the technical stuff doing the work to project management processes now back in time a term project management life cycle was used the project management life cycle is all about managing that's why it has the word management in it it's about managing the work see all right the next section that we have in the PMBOK guide is project management process group so each process of project management could be put into a group so 1.2.4.4 is the processes but we could actually group those processes here's an example develop project charter is the first process of project management in the PMBOK Guide 6 edition. It's called Develop Project Charter. What does it mean? What is a charter? A charter is a document. It authorizes the project and it authorizes the project manager. Think about a document that says, hey, you, Joe Blow, Susie Public, whatever your name is, you are the project manager and you can apply resources to manage this project so on and so forth here's what the project is about it's a charter you see that is a project management process that is not coding that is not testing that is not baking that is not tarring that is not doing medical billing it's none of that it's not technical work it's project management related work it's called develop project charter it's a process now we can take that process develop project charter and we can put it into a group initiating is the group it belongs because initiating is the genesis it's the beginning of the project see what I'm saying we have another process called develop project management plan that is developing a plan for the project now that will be grouped differently from initiating it's not initiating it's gone beyond the initiating stage it's now in the planning stage you see so each process can be grouped and each of the 49 can be grouped see if you wanted to get an idea should I show you something really scary go to page 25 take a look now it's not that scary if you take it in bite-sized chunks and I'm gonna be breaking it down for you <laughs> have you gone off to page 25 come back come back don't go there <laughs> we're gonna get there eventually all right let's talk about the next thing here it's project management knowledge areas so in the PMBOK guide each of these processes belongs to not just a process group but also a knowledge area it's an area of knowledge that you can classify this process in for example develop project charter belongs to the initiating process group but it also belongs to the project integration management knowledge area you see so we'll talk a lot more about all of this stuff as we go along remember this is really high level 
And as you begin to read all of this stuff in a PMBOK guide, it's going to make a lot more sense. It's going to make a lot more sense to you. So I'm giving you the top of the waves. I'm giving you Phil's version. <laughs> you know, as you go through the PMBOK guide, it's probably going to make a lot more sense to you. Okay. But at a very high level, really quick, if you were following along and going through the knowledge areas, you probably got there. So the knowledge areas of project management, I'll give you a quick mnemonic. And the mnemonic is, I saw six Cubans quietly rolling cigars, really puffing smoke. Now you can make your own mnemonic up, but I for integration, S for scope, six schedule, Cubans cost, quietly, quality, roll in resources, cigars, communications, really risk, puffin, procurement, and smoke, stakeholders. So the 10 knowledge areas are integration, scope, schedule, cost, quality, resources, communications, risk, procurement, and stakeholder management. So I hope that helps you remember them. And last but not least, next thing we're going to talk about is project management data and information. So in the world of the PMI, we have various components revolving around data and information that you need to be aware of. We have something called work performance data. We also have something called work performance information. And the last thing is work performance reports. So I'm going to show you an example really quickly about these three different things, giving you an example. So here's the example. Remember, WPD is a raw observation. Phil, a resource on this project, is suddenly unavailable for five days. That's data. For this to become information, you have to further analyze it. So what does it mean if Phil is not available for five days? Well, he's a key resource on this project. He's a subject matter expert on the QA and QC team. He's got vast knowledge about this project. Quality will be severely impacted if Phil is not available. Also, there could be a four to eight week schedule delay due to his unavailability. And it will add additional cost and penalties to the project totaling up to $50,000. Because when the QA people come from our customer and they see that Phil is not available, as was promised previously in the contract, there's going to be trouble. And we could have penalties for him not being available. Also, there are risks that we won't achieve our goals as expected. This now becomes information that needs to be included in a weekly work performance report, for example. So Phil's not being available is a raw observation, but when we analyze it, we truly understand the impact. You see, that is converting your work performance data to work performance information. And this work performance information needs to be included in a report. So let's take a look at what else could be work performance data. Number of defects. Oh, we've got five defects. So what? You have to analyze it. Oh, we've spent $200 actual cost. Analyze it. Oh, we've spent five days on this project so far. Actual duration. So what? What does it mean? How are we performing in the context of the plan? Don't just tell me actual cost. Don't just tell me duration. Tell me the implication of these things. A KPI. Oh, the CPI is 0 0.9 for this work package. What does it mean? You see, so work performance data could be any of these things. It's a raw observation, but it has to be analyzed. Now, I'm going to give you some specifics. You might want to come back and watch this video again, because this is a recurring theme in the PMBOK guide. Work performance data, work performance information, and work performance reports. How do you wrap your mind around it? The first piece, WPD, I call it, is an output of only direct and manage project work. Remember this, direct and manage project work. It's a process. 
Remember I talked about the 49 processes on page 25? Well, there is a special process called Direct and Manage Project Work. And this gives you WPD, okay? So WPD from Direct and Manage Project Work is an input to those monitoring and controlling processes that fall outside the integration management knowledge area. I know it's a lot to take in. You're going to have to come back to this video and watch it to understand what exactly I'm talking about. Because if you don't know the 49 processes, you're going to find this hard to swallow, okay? But that's all right. Come back to the video and watch it after you begin diving into the processes and after you begin to dabble into the inputs, the tools and techniques and outputs, all right? So the key thing is WPD comes from direct and manage project work and it goes to a bunch of processes to be analyzed, all right? Then we get work performance information. It's an output of those monitoring and controlling processes that fall outside of integration. So if you go to page 25, I'm talking about scope, schedule, cost, quality, resources, communications, risk, procurement, and stakeholder. All of those have a process within the monitoring and controlling process group, okay? All of those processes, they generate work performance information. And lastly, work performance information is an input to a process known as monitor and control project work. And from that, we get work performance reports. But wait, there's more. Direct and manage project work gives you work performance data. It goes to all of these guys here, validate scope, control scope, all the way down to monitor stakeholder engagement. And then from these, we get work performance information as an output. And that becomes an input to monitor and control project work. And from that, we get work performance reports, which goes to these processes, perform integrated change control all the way down to monitor risks. This is a very important concept for your exam. I would suggest you come back to this video, watch it again and again and again, all right? One last reminder about your mnemonic. I saw six Cubans quietly rolling cigars, really puffing smoke. This is really going to help you remember the knowledge areas, and then we will build upon that, knowing the processes, the process groups, and so on. You might want to look out for my video on the 49 processes of project management, because instead of covering page 25 for another 40 minutes, you can just watch that video. It has all of the stuff that you need to watch, all right? I'm going to endeavor to put a link to that video right here so you can actually watch that video, all right? Next, let's talk about tailoring. What do we mean by tailoring? Tailoring actually means we are tailoring the Project Management Body of Knowledge Guide. So we need to tailor the Project Management Body of Knowledge Guide to our various projects. How do you tailor the Project Management Body of Knowledge Guide? And what do we mean by Project Management Methodology Tailoring? Two things. You've got a lot of stuff in the PMBOK Guide. You're not expected to throw the whole kitchen sink at your projects, folks. You need to tailor it. You need to tailor which processes from the 49 you use on your projects. Why do we need to do this? Because time is precious and resources are precious. And we don't just want to work processes for work in them sake. We want to use processes that are useful to us. So this is my own take on it. I think about the 80-20 principle or the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the gains are gotten from 20% of the efforts or 80% of your clients generate 20% of your revenues, 20% of your clients generate those 80% of the revenues, that kind of thing, all right? In my mind, 20% of the 49 processes could give you an 80% payoff, whatever that looks like 
but you don't need to throw the entire kitchen sink at the project. Are all the 49 important? Yes. Do you have to use them on every single process? No. You don't have to use every single process, and you don't have to use every single tool, technique, input, and output. So you need to do this with you know, some caution. Don't go overboard. So tailoring is necessary. Projects are unique, and circumstances are different. And time is money, all right? So when we think about the project management methodology, think about your firm, what works best. Think about the culture. Think about what has happened before you became the PM, okay? And be flexible. Don't kill people with documentation. People don't need to be killed with documents. People need what works. That's really what PMI is trying to tell you, all right? So project management methodologies could be developed by the experts in the firm. That's why I said think about those who came before you. It could be purchased from a vendor. Maybe the company decides to use a method that has been purchased from a vendor or from some professional association or government agency. All of that needs to be taken into account. Okay, so when you apply project management, you want to apply it in a sensible fashion. You don't want to apply it in a random fashion. Okay, apply it in a sensible fashion and tailor it and then apply it in a sensible fashion. All right, next we're going to be talking about project management business documents. The two main business documents I would like to bring your attention to here. And the first business document is something called a business case. A business case is a document that makes a case for the project. It establishes why the project should be done, tells you about the benefits of the project, and it gives you some inkling as to why a particular solution was used. And we use this as a basis for authorizing the project. You could also think about this as a documented feasibility study about why the project is being authorized or why the project should be authorized. All right, the next thing that we have in this section is called a project benefits management plan. A benefits management plan is an explanation about how the benefits are going to be maximized and sustained, how they're going to be realized. It basically tells you this is or these are the benefits and this is how the benefits are going to be maximized and not just maximized, but also sustained. We don't want those benefits to fizzle out. Sustainment is important in this world. Next thing we have here is the project charter and the project management plan. These are key documents. So I talked about the project charter previously. The project charter has got your high level project description, the reasoning behind the project, why should the project be authorized, who is the project manager, and someone called the project sponsor also comes on the map here. Okay. And the next thing here is project success measures. What makes the project or a project successful? What does it look like? How are we going to measure success? What factors could impact success? Those need to be talked about. We also need to think about return on investment. Some other financial measures such as NPV and IRR, and I'm not going into this payback period and benefit cost ratio. These could also be looked into as far as a success measure. The higher the NPV, the better. Higher the return on investment, the better. The higher the IRR, the better. The shorter the payback period, the better. The payback period is that period of time that it takes to recoup your initial investment. And the benefit cost ratio is the benefits versus the cost, the ratio of the benefits or revenue. So when we talk about benefits, we're talking about revenue, the ratio of that to cost. All of these measures could be used to establish project success. So I hope that helped you. We have covered roughly 36 pages in 45 minutes, roughly a minute plus per page, as promised. 
Now, if you wanted a deeper dive into this stuff, we have a full-blown 35 contact hour course. This is but the tip of the iceberg. Just to get you to the point where you can pick up this 756-page book and begin to crack the thing open. All right, so that's chapter one. Don't forget, we have chapter two and three still coming up. So stay tuned to the channel. Don't forget to click on the subscribe button. And don't forget to hit like if you really found this useful. We would like to hear from you. Let's engage. Let's have a conversation. Make sure you leave your comments below and your questions. Thank you very much for your audience. And I wish you all the best as you study for the PMP exam based on the sixth edition. Bye for now.